Welcome all to using Python to give the last one. Um, give, the, give, give Scott some clapping. Thanks. Um, so this talk um, is really about, well, I guess it's more of a celebration. The last talk was excellent about the architecture and such like. I guess this is a compliment in that we talk very little about the architecture, but it's more about talking about the problem that we're solving um, and why we like using Python so much to solve it. Um, so I'm the uh, technical director at LimeJump. Uh, we've been going as a company proper for a couple of years. Um, let's get this next slide. So uh, LimeJump is a utility in the UK. Um, we're able to trade energy, and the thing that we're interested today in is um, aggregation services. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about that in a minute but um, we work with small companies uh, in association with the National Grid. Um, so the National Grid in the UK own the high volt electricity network um, just for England and Wales, and they work to maintain that, and also they try to keep supply and demand of electricity balanced, and that's kind of where we come in. So um, if we go back to 1870 um, or... 1933 in the UK when our first national uh, power network was created. You had big, mostly coal-powered uh, power stations that created a large amount of power, which was then distributed through high-voltage lines across the country, going into lower-voltage lines, eventually down to big factories, smaller factories, and consumers. Now, that worked well back in 1870 and 1930s, but... Uh, Things are changing now. Um, we've got concerns about climate, so we don't want to have big coal-fired uh, power stations or um, other big stations for that matter. And there are new types of uh, power generation coming in, like wind, solar generation. We've got some wave power. And other things like aerobic gen uh, digestion, where you use um, waste food products and animal manure to generate gas, which can then uh, power engines, which produce electricity. And we've got landfill gas, which is methane coming off uh, waste um, to produce electricity again. And just now, uh, things like batteries are coming in. So the power network has to change to uh, meet these new challenges. So this is the kind of thing that we're starting to see. So we're getting a much more distributed power system. Um, so you can see some solar panels and some aerobic digestion there and uh, all sorts of different ways of producing power, and they're working on a much smaller scale. The amount of electricity they generate is smaller. They don't come down these uh, high voltage lines so much as more local systems. So we need to start controlling them more locally to uh, uh, balance balance the grid. Um, but really, you know, what do I mean by balancing the grid? So. If you think back to the uh, original power stations, you had a, a big um, coal fire boiling water up, turning it through turbines. That would turn a huge shaft, and then uh, if you go back to your magnetic field theory, if you turn a shaft in magnetic field, you can generate electricity. And the speed of that shaft is proportional to the frequency of the uh, AC current you get out. So, what we're trying to do is to keep this shaft moving at a, a constant velocity so we get 50 hertz out. So what we have to think is if there's too much load on this shaft, say you've got um, too many lights on, or for example a power station is broken down, then this shaft is going to start slowing down because there's not enough power to push it. The frequency of electricity will go down. And vice versa, if it's the middle of the night and no one's really using electricity, and suddenly the wind starts growing very strongly in Scotland, as happens sometimes. Um, you get too much wind power, so there's more supply than demand, and uh, the frequency starts to go up. So that's kind of summarised here. So uh, when supply is equal to demand, which is where we want to be, everything is at 50 hertz. And then as supply is outstripped by demand, the uh, frequency goes down. And when supply is higher than demand, then the uh, frequency goes up. 
And really, uh, what we're trying to do is to keep it within 49.5 and 50.5. In reality, we keep it in a much tighter band than that. But when we start getting to these points, then we start having problems. Um, electronic equipment will stop working in some cases. And if things get really bad, you'll get a complete blackout. And that's really not what we want. So that's where we come in. So as I said earlier, the National Grid's job is to uh, balance uh, supply and demand. So they have products which we uh, work with customers. So we work with lots of small customers who aren't big enough to go to the National Grid directly. So we coordinate their response um, and then sell them as a, a group together to deliver different products to the National Grid. Uh, the one we've been working on for the last year or we've been uh, starting to um, implement for the last year with customers is a static response. So when things are getting quite bad, so when frequency goes down to 49.7 or up to 50.3, we either get customers who produce electricity at um, to turn things on if the frequency has gone low or if they use electricity we get them to turn things off and vice versa when the uh, frequency of the grid goes too high we get people who produce electricity to turn their production down or customers who use electricity to turn their usage of electricity up. Um, I'm going to touch upon this a lot more and how we do that um, but then also in the future we're going to be starting to look at things like um, dynamic products where we track the grid frequency so we keep it in a much tighter band um, and you get two seconds to respond to a change in grid frequency and then enhanced frequency response which is responding very quickly and that's coming out in the future um, in the next one to two years and there you have to respond to a change in uh, grid frequency within one second so the only thing capable of doing that at the moment is to have a big battery and to turn the power output from the battery up and down. So what exactly do we do and where does Python come in? Well, because we're working with lots of small customers, we have to go and install a panel on each of their sites. So this sits with generators or, or with factory equipment. And we have a PLC in there, a programmable logic controller, which is an um, industrial computer, effectively, that uh, you can use for automation tasks. Um, we have data being back for a 3G modem. We have a um, quad-core, it's a Raspberry Pi type device uh, where all our Python sits um, at a customer site level. And also we're starting to use things like Arduinos to uh, control and measure customer equipment. And also we have uh, power meters which sit on the uh, power lines out of equipment so that we can measure what's going on, or how much electricity they're producing. Um, and we do this, we, we monitor power every second, so we can see second by second how much power a, a customer is producing or using. Um, we measure frequency on site, so we, we know what's happening in terms of frequency on site 10 times a second. And we also measure what our system is doing uh, 10 times a second, so we can keep a track of uh, whether everything's performing properly. Now, for those of you in the last talk, this is... Uh, a very similar architecture to the one being uh, discussed in the last talk. Um, I'm not going to talk about it quite so much. Um, other than to say that uh, the data logger there is pure Python and everything to the right of it is also pretty much Python except the uh, front end stuff. Um, and everything to the left of the data logger, so the submeter controllers and PLCs, they're in a mixture of C and um, PLC code which I'll show in a second, uh, which is some ladder logic and some well, programming by diagram, really. Um, and then we've got industrial power meters, which we communicate through a protocol called Modbus from the 1970s. So we've uh, got those connected to assets, and we can also control assets from there. Um, I should also point out the data logger doesn't just log data. It also sets up the PLC so we can have a semi-autonomous uh, response to, to events. So the uh, PLC is the part that responds when frequency goes out of the spec that I was talking about earlier. And it's also the PLC that, that controls the output of an asset if we were to want to do dynamic or enhanced frequency response. Um, so that's kind of how we do things. Why do we use Python? Uh, well, it's fast to develop. Um, this has been developed within two years, really. I think we've written virtually everything that's in production now within the last two years. 
which uh, I, I come from a C and C++ background. I don't think we could have done this if we'd use C. Um, there's a huge selection of free libraries. Um, I'm preaching to the converted, I guess, with this, but uh, it, it's transformed the way that we can do things, especially with things like Modbus. Um, and the testing, um, I'm a big fan of PyTest, so we use PyTest in all our testing. And I say, lastly, we use Python, so I can come to EuroPython each year. So where have we been having problems with Python? Um, that's a good question. We haven't been having massive problems with Python. We've been moving to async IO recently, and we've cut down our load on our embedded uh, processes, the processes of the customer sites, by five, tenfold by using uh, async IO. So that's been really great. Um, we think it's not quite as elegant as it could be, but that seems to be changing a lot with each new version of Python, so we're really enjoying using that. But I guess the biggest problem we have is uh, finding good Python developers in London, um, which I'm sure lots of people can sympathize with. So that's kind of really our problems or things that we've been using. Where would we like to use Python? Well, as I said before, I like to talk yesterday on the micro bit and uh, starting to use Python in uh, microprocessors. Um, the diagram on the right is part of the PLC software that I was talking about earlier. I've spent days and days with our um, PLC suppliers debugging this software. Uh, it's, it's tricky. Um, it's very, very tricky. This is the kind of code you get. Um, you can't put test harnesses around it very easily, so you end up having to try and create every single uh, situation by a mixture of um, forcing variables within the program and creating the conditions with I.O. and uh, hardware to try and test it. It's going to respond how you want it to respond in each way. So um, if anyone has any ideas for getting us out of using PLCs, then I'd be really, really pleased to, to hear them, uh, especially if it's using Python. Um, I'd also say we've been using embedded controls with C, but again, that's not quite as nice, uh, in, in my opinion, anyway. So what are we going to do next? Um, this is a test case from last week. Um, I spoke about dynamic frequency response. So if you look at the uh, second graph down, you'll see this is a test profile we've injected into one of our panels. This is a battery site, so this is a big solar panel array with an 800 kilowatt battery attached to it. So the uh, battery is charged up by the solar array during the day and then we can discharge it when the customer can get the best prices for the electricity. So what we've done here is we've got a charged system. I should say SOC stands for state of charge. Um, so 140 actually means 70% charge because there's two battery systems attached. Um, so what we've done is inject different frequencies into that. And if you look at the top one, the kilowatt out, so that's the kilowatt output of the battery mirrors the frequency. So as frequency goes down, the output of the battery goes up and tracks pretty much the frequency um, as it goes up and down. And you can see the battery discharges and then charges again as we use the power in different ways. So once we've done that, our next job is going to be uh, delivering dynamic response. And, which I haven't mentioned now, this is a response at a local level. So this is just a battery responding to the grid. Um, what we're looking to do next as well is to have a response across several pieces of equipment. So we might have an engine and a battery, um, maybe solar farms as well. And what we're looking to do is have each one of them produce their own individual response, which when summed together creates this kind of group response. Uh, this means that a lot more uh, customers can get involved in this program and we can give a larger um, lump of, of responsive power to the national grid, so it kind of helps everyone. Um, and let's do some more Python as well. And that's it. Who has any questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, at what kind of scale is this running? How many of these devices are running? So we had our first site installs last year. We're now in the 
tens of installs. Um, probably by the end of the year, we'll be moving up to hundreds of installs and uh, on from there. Um, in terms of power, um, sites range from about um, 100 kilowatt for, for small sites up to um, a couple of megawatts for uh, big sites. So if you compare that with a power station, a power station might be 1,300 megawatts. So we're, uh, we're, we're rising very quickly. <laughs> so it is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understood this correctly from what you said earlier, but is it the case that when um, demand falls so much that the frequency is at risk of rising or, or demand rises and the frequency is at risk of falling, that you will get large users of electricity to use more or less? Yeah, that's right. And, and is there a possibility of doing this? Not, I guess you can do that with, very easily with huge users, but n with embedded systems in all kinds of devices in people's homes, you could presumably get ordinary things like fridges and heating systems and so on to use more or less appropriately. Is that, is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah. So um, we've started at um, the industrial scale because uh, it's easier to have a viable business at that scale. But as we refine our technology, we can move into smaller and smaller producers. Um, so in the end, hopefully, yes, we'll be able to use uh, home supplies. So if you think of a fridge, for instance, uh, a fridge is only on some of the time. But if you had a thousand fridges, you could predict the uh, base load that the aggregated thousand fridges use. So yeah, yeah, that's definitely what we're aiming towards. Um, how much was security uh, a consideration? Because I could imagine if these systems are hacked, you could destabilize the power grid pretty easily. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, security is a big consideration, yeah. So, yeah, we can turn on and off these big batteries and engines. So, yeah, that is something we think about a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to <laughs> talk about that bit too much. Though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, is it the case that when the frequency drops, you respond, but what's... What happens if you respond and somebody else responds and somebody else responds? Isn't there a risk? How do you, how do you not like yo-yo? That, uh, that is uh, very true, actually, and has happened. Um, so we're all employed by the national grid, so they know how much the response will be. So they contract out a set response. But you're right, um, it has been seen on a few occasions where everyone responds at once and you go from having low frequency to having high frequency. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one for the national grid to sort out, luckily. <laughs> but that's why they're moving to the um, dynamic responses because, of course, they're much more granular. So they, they correct things much more quickly so you don't get that yo-yoing. Um, I should probably also mention that when we're moving away from these big rotating shaft-type systems, the power generation, the coal-fired power stations, we're losing a lot of inertia in the system, which is a stabilizing effect. So a big shaft turning acts like a flywheel, whereas uh, with things like wind, they don't have a flywheel as such because they're electronic converters. So yeah, as the UK reduces that, we're, we're gonna become more unstable. So we have to be more careful to stop this swinging up and down the frequency. Any more questions? Great. Um, give. I'll answer questions if anyone wants afterwards or, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah.